and welcome to Scare You to Sleep. I'm your host, Shelby Scott, and I'm going to read you a few bedtime stories. Before we begin, I just uploaded my first YouTube video to the Scare You to Sleep YouTube channel with me actually in it. Some of you have followed and you've seen that I have uploaded videos, but they're just the episodes with a static image and uh, I've been doing that for a while now, but I decided to dip my toe into making actual videos. This first one is just a kind of a shorty, it's about 10 minutes long, it's just me reading some horror poetry. I'm just getting the hang of editing and setting up shots and things on my own. So yeah, go follow Scare You to Sleep on YouTube and like and subscribe. <laughs> this week I've decided to go from little to big, short to long with our stories. So first up is a story by Poppy Evans called Happy Anniversary. The rain hits the window. Sounds almost like someone's trying to get in, furiously banging on the glass. I stare indifferently at the water droplets as Claire de Lune plays softly. It was his favorite song. I thought it appropriate. I walk slowly around our living room, touching everything wishing I could keep all the memories attached to this place wrapped up in a little box. But I can't. I remember the day we walked into our home for the first time. The pure joy and electricity were palpable in the air as we laughed and danced and drank cheap wine. It was almost sickening how happy we were, how in love we were. We didn't have any money. We could barely afford our rent. But our love was enough, right? Eventually, reality always sets in. So we woke up. He got a job at an office in the mailroom, and I went to nursing school. Three years later, and I'm a registered nurse. He somehow wormed his way into a promotion, and... Then another, till finally, we are living the life we always dreamt of. But one thing is gone. The love, that spark of electricity, has been extinguished. He talks to me as if I'm a disobedient dog, making demands in a clipped tone. And I obey. Because maybe he's just had a bad day at work. Everyone goes through rough patches. But the barking orders never stop. It's September 12th. I've put on my red dress. It's his favorite. I hear the door slam, and my heart jumps into my throat with excitement. I run out into the hallway and grin at him. He stops dead in his tracks, his mouth hanging wide open. The stench of alcohol wafts through the hallway. Slowly, he looks me up and down. What the fuck are you wearing that for? (laughs) You look ridiculous. He says with a spiteful chuckle. My blood runs cold. Well, what are you making for dinner? I'm starving, he says, dropping his coat on the floor carelessly. I'd always hated that. There was a coat rack right next to the door, but he could never seem to hang his goddamn coat up. Well, I guess at least he was always consistent. Except that this year, he'd forgotten something. Our anniversary. Every year, without fail, I would come out in my red dress, he would exclaim how beautiful I looked, and wish me a happy anniversary, and then I would cook us both steak. He likes his extra bloody. 
the one night a year he could stomach showing me a morsel of human decency. And he forgot. The rain has stopped now. But Claire de Lune still plays. I turn back to the kitchen where I am finishing cooking our meal. I hum along as I dance through the kitchen, reliving all our happy memories together. Dinner's up, I sing as I waltz over to the table. One medium rare for me, and one extra bloody for him. I set it down on the table and begin. It's delicious. Best meal I've ever made. Blood oozes off his plate like tar onto the carpet. Oh, darling, you really have to be more careful, I say to the severed head on the table. I chuckle as its eyes stare coldly off into the distance. <laughs> Happy anniversary, my love. Next up is a story by Tamsin Murphy. And they didn't give me a title for the story, so let's just call it The Taste. Is it rolling? He asked the intern, who stood out of place in the corner of the interviewing room. Yes, sir. She responded quickly, pushing her round glasses farther up the bridge of her nose, despite them already sitting comfortably. Good. Good. Dr. Clearston cleared his throat and placed his arms on the wooden table, his hands folded and inviting. <clears throat> Please, uh, Mr. Dayton, tell me what you saw. He nodded encouragingly at the person in front of him, but he kept his expression unreadable. The older man was shaking, his calloused hands wrapped around a warm cup of coffee he couldn't remember getting. He stared into its contents not quite sure anymore what coffee should taste like. Nothing tasted the same since I... His voice sounded foreign off his tongue, the rasp in his throat suffocating the sound. I, I can't remember the exact date. Um, it must have been <sighs> only a few days ago. He shook his head, trying to recall the moment exactly. It, it was raining, I remember that. It was raining, like anything. He smiled faintly at the foggy memory of his wife complaining about the harsh weather, afraid for her flowers. I remember going to work. First time I'd been back in a few weeks. I'd taken off for a long vacation with my wife. These memories came easier. The memory of warm sunlight on his cheeks, the crash of the waves against the beach, his toes in the sand. It must have been in the morning, early. My shift started at 7.30. Dr. Clearston nodded remembering the details from the police report as he reassured the man in front of him that his memory wasn't fooling him. The man put one sweaty hand on his lap, deciding he'd been holding the coffee too long without taking a sip. I got out of my car. I walked up to the door of the facility and I input my code to the door as usual. The man's voice was beginning to quiver. He paused, his gaze fixed on the steam billowing from the coffee. 
He had to remind himself a few times that he was still alive, that time was still moving. The man tapped his fingertip against the styrofoam cup, mustering the courage to continue. Do you know the stages of decay, Dr. Clearston? He leaned forward in his seat, his torso against the cold metal table. Yes, I do. Dr. Clearston was growing frustrated at the pace of the man's storytelling, but he masked his emotions with practiced aptitude, taking it out instead on the cap of the pen he held in his hand. He rotated it between his thumb and index finger, sliding the clip of it underneath his nail. He risked a quick glance at the old recorder whirring away on the table. Exasperated at his own impatience, when he found it had only been a few minutes. Do you know what it... <sighs> Do you know what they smell like, Dr. Clearston? The man's voice was only a whisper. So low, the doctor feared it wouldn't catch on the recording. But the man had to speak low to force down the nausea. Uh, I'm afraid I don't, Mr. Dayton. The man had looked up, searching for any kind of sympathy from the doctor. He could feel the image coming to the forefront of his mind, his body returning to the moment. He felt the cold concrete of the floor, the palms of his hands scraping against the coarse stones. The skin ripping. He sat still in the metal chair of the interrogation room. When I opened that door, the man licked his lips. When I opened the door, Dr. Clearston, the smell hit me first body. They tell me that the smell was the bloat. The fucker was just... The man could feel himself becoming frantic. He could hear the mania in his voice, but he had to tell his story one more time. He... It, it was just me. That's all was left, Doc. That wasn't a person anymore. He had to be there, in that room, with that pile of flesh, one more time. <clears throat> the police informed me that it was some kind of animal that must have gotten in that night to find something to eat. Reports say the deceased was a night watch by the name of Connor Allwater. Clearston had leaned back, his own body betraying him by shaking with what he hoped was sympathetic nervousness, but feared it was perhaps his own. He hoped the sensibility of the report, the clear cut and dry case of an animal attack, the reality would remind him he was in no danger here. His palpitating heart thought otherwise. I don't think it was, Doc. I, I don't think an animal is capable of that kind of mutilation. The man remembered. The flies. The man remembered. The thick, black fog of them. He remembered the maggots, the squelch as they ate the wet flesh. He remembered the beetles scurrying in and out of holes that humans shouldn't have. He remembered the creature, the one he didn't tell the police about. He remembered the thing 
crouched over the body, fistfuls of meat, muscle, and blood hanging from its unhinged maw. The man remembered the taste. And last but certainly not least is a story by William Fallow, and this is A Haunting in Marlton. When I lived with my parents, our house was next to a cemetery. My father claimed it was cheaper to live near the dead than the living, and quieter, too. My bedroom window faced it, and I sometimes saw the grieving people standing around a grave as they said goodbye to a loved one. It affected me in many ways and I became obsessed with death without realizing the darkness I was entering. My father didn't hear the random noises coming from there, and never saw the occasional shadows moving among the graves. But I heard and saw everything. And then came the day we were to move. My father died, and my mother said we couldn't afford the house anymore. On our last day there, I got up the courage to walk into the cemetery. In the daylight, everything seemed alive, not dead. Under the bright sun, my fear ebbed and I became more curious. I wanted to find out more and started to feel sad that we were leaving. I passed the entrance gate and a black cat walked out from behind a statue of an angel that stood over a young child's grave. I remained frozen in place. Could it be the child's spirit? I had never seen that cat there before, despite staring out of the bedroom window for many years. Chills ran through me when the cat rubbed against my legs. I remained frozen in place until it purred. She followed me, and I named her Spooky. I mean, finding a black cat in a cemetery is spooky. I took her with me when I moved to a one-bedroom apartment in Marlton. It seemed like a peaceful community, but I missed the cemetery. Maybe growing up next to a cemetery affected me more than I thought because I was drawn to the supernatural. I made a podcast and named it Catch the Dark. Before I knew it, Catch the Dark was on all platforms in my local area. It was about cemeteries, death, ghosts, and all things dark. And then I got an email. It started with my name, Jenna. A guy said there was someone in an empty house near a cemetery. It had to be haunted. I wondered if it was a hoax. I looked at the location and gasped. It was a house right next to a cemetery. My old house. I emailed him and said I would check it out for the podcast. I drove to my old house. Spooky was my partner now. Besides, she liked car rides, which made me wonder if she was the spirit of a child after all. Children loved car rides, and cats rarely did, so it made sense. I got out and walked to my old house that neighbored the cemetery. The house's front yard was covered with trees and bushes. No wonder the woman who emailed me thought it was haunted. It sure looked like it. 
I fought back the urge to leave, not sure I could face the memories. I looked up at my bedroom window and thought I saw a face. Was it some kind of memory of me staring at the cemetery come alive? Or was a ghost there? The fallen leaves I stepped on made a loud crunching sound that gave my presence away. Nobody has lived here since I moved out. I heard someone bought the house then left before even moving in, and I wondered if something scared them away. The wooden deck creaked when I stepped on it. I then caught myself and decided to look in the back window. It was too dark to see anything. Fortunately, I knew how to get inside. One of the rear back windows had never shut properly. I found the defective window and pushed. The creaking sound when it opened startled me, even though I expected it. I started recording on my phone. No light came from inside the house, and no sound. I was getting ready to enter through the window when the night came alive. I heard animals nearby. I looked back and saw a cat. I smiled at it, and it was joined by another one. I wondered if they wanted Spooky back. I crawled into the window, lost my balance, and tumbled onto the wooden floor. Puffs of dust blew around me. Inside, the musty air penetrated everything, and it was hard to breathe. I stumbled around in the dark. I went upstairs, and each step creaked louder until I reached the top one. Only one bedroom door was closed, and that was mine. After checking all the other ones, I prepared to open it. With my phone in one hand, I leaned against it and listened. Nothing indicated anyone was there, so I pushed the door open and entered the room. I filmed it with my iPhone. Then someone stepped into the room, and I turned around to stare into the face of the man at the cemetery. Jenna was all he said. He knew who I was. I froze in panic. Before I could react, he reached out and grabbed my shoulder and pushed. I fell to the floor. I struggled to catch my breath and used the bed to steady myself. The man moved closer to the window. Behind him, shadows filled the window. I pulled myself up and the man pushed me back against the wall. I don't know who you are, I yelled. What do you want with me? Before he could answer, something scratched the window. It intensified until a small crack appeared. I saw cats. I grabbed the window latch, which was so old it flipped over quickly. I then shoved the window open just as the man reached for me. I collapsed as the cats crawled into the room. The man ran down the steps, followed by the cats. I caught my breath and looked at my phone. The screen was cracked, but it still worked, and I called the police. I glimpsed Spooky. She was watching from the car window. She looked sad. It was almost completely dark now, and the cemetery was quiet. I sat on the front step like I did so often as a young girl in the past. Every muscle in my body hurt, but when I checked my phone, I smiled when I discovered that it had recorded the fight. I turned it off when a police car approached. The police took my phone with the promise to return it to me tomorrow when I came to the station. I'm Sergeant Melissa. I'm glad you're okay. There are a few people that went missing around here. And that man might be responsible. What about the ghosts? I blurted out. Ghosts? There are no ghosts in Marlton, she said. I shook my head, but didn't argue. Then went home with Spooky. And after a hot shower... 
I fell asleep in my bed, but kept waking up when I thought dirt was being shoveled on top of me. Usually it was Spooky kneading me like I was dough and she was making bread. But now, it was a nightmare. I went to the police station and filled out a report. Sergeant Melissa handed me my phone. We couldn't find any fingerprints, but we used your phone to identify the man. She stopped and looked out the window. An ambulance drove by. Who is it? Someone that lived in the neighborhood. Are you going to arrest him? No. I stood up. Why not? He attacked me. Because he's already dead. He has been for seven years. What? He's dead. Used to live a few houses over from your old house. The memories came of a creepy man. He watched me all the time and was caught peeping into teenage girls' windows. He also sprayed the stray cats with his garden hose and threw things at him. Ah, uh, I didn't know what to say. Is he... Is he buried in the cemetery across the street? Yes. So he could be alive. No. The medical examiner is sure he was dead. You said there are no ghosts in Marlton. Maybe I was wrong. She handed me a card with her phone number on it. Call me if you see him again. I logged onto my computer at the apartment, posted the recent information and recordings, and said it would be the last one. Later, I checked the Catch the Dark podcast email, and there were lots of them, maybe even hundreds, and they all told dark stories they said were real that nobody believed them. Other listeners sent money to me, begging me to keep Catch the Dark going. I needed to think about the podcast. My mind was not the same. I have nightmares all the time and can't go near a cemetery without picturing that man. Sadness overwhelmed me at times. I knew that there was one place where I needed to go. I needed to face my fear. I returned to the house. There were no cats in sight. I let Spooky out. If she wanted to return to the cemetery cats, I couldn't stop her. She ran to the child's grave, where I first saw her, then disappeared behind the headstone. I sighed. I lost my only friend. I went to the house. There was no evidence that anything had ever happened there except for the remnants of a piece of caution tape that clung to a bush. I froze when I heard what sounded like tiny feet pattering across the wooden floors inside. I hoped they were mice. I wondered if Spooky would return to the child's grave and vanish into the spirit world. I didn't believe she was one of the local stray cats. I saw shadows that could be ghosts throughout the house. I once heard someone say that once you fully believe in something, you'll see it everywhere. I fully believe in ghosts now. I walked past the lines on the wall where my parents measured my height. They stopped halfway up and I fought back tears. I climbed the creaky stairs running my hands across the walls, thinking of all the memories here. I hear distant laughter and crying as my parents went through the years. I was their only child. I wonder why they never had another one.
They never told me a reason. Why think of it now? I reached my bedroom and saw the chair by the window. I sat down in it. I stared out at the graveyard like I did so many years ago. It seemed like time went in a circle and brought me back here. I then took out my phone and emailed the guy who told me about the house. I hesitated, then added to let me know if he wanted to get a cup of coffee sometime, and that I had quite a story to tell him. I kept staring at the cemetery across the road. Shadows darted between the graves like they did so many years ago. I heard a noise and saw that the cats watched over the cemetery like sentinels. Spooky wasn't with them. They looked up at me and seemed to acknowledge that I was a friend. Were there other ghosts out there? I remember seeing them as a child. One thing was for sure. There were ghosts in Marlton. I dozed off, then woke up to something rubbing against my leg. I almost yelled out, then looked down as Spooky curled up on the floor next to me. Maybe she decided to stay with me, instead of returning to the spiritual world. I had to trust that she wanted to be with me and not leave. After all, love is stronger than darkness. Isn't it? Thanks for listening. Thank you to all of my authors this week. Poppy, Tamsin, William. Thank you so much for sending in your stories. I hope you enjoyed what I did with them. Remember, if you have a story that you'd like to have the Scare You to Sleep production treatment, you can send it to scare you to sleep at gmail.com uh follow the show on twitter youtube now <laughs> um instagram and facebook all at scare you to sleep um facebook again if you want to join the group just answer the questions with podcast podcast or you can leave little notes that's fun too um but yeah if you want to just bypass all that that way i just need to know if you're not a robot podcast podcast is completely fine um i believe that's all for this week i've had a pretty busy week with just um you know uh, adult stuff paperwork things that has been very tiring it's 3 17 a.m right now on saturday morning i know i have adhd sorry that these are always a little bit late <laughs> I'm, I'm working on it. I promise this week it was all going to be on time. And then some, uh, red tape stuff came up in my life. Um, but yeah, let's see. I did bake one thing this week. It wasn't very good. I don't even want to tell you what it was. It just didn't turn out that great. Um, it, I don't know if it's that it didn't turn out that great or if it's like, do you ever bake or cook something and you realize once it's done, you're like, I wasn't in the mood for this why did I do this? I thought I was. Now I'm not. Um, so yeah, I'm not even going to talk about it. Let's not even go there. Um, I'm very tired. Um, let's see. What? Am I forgetting anything? Oh, um, remember ad-free episodes available on Patreon starting at a dollar a month. Um, so yeah, if you want ad-free, that way it's easier to sleep to. Um, if you do actually fall asleep to this show, some of you do. I know it's in the title, but I know not all of you actually sleep to the show. But if you do, yeah, consider going to Patreon. And um, there's a bunch of bonus stuff there as well. Again, I'm working on some stuff that's specific for the tiers. Um, but right now, as of right now, um, but not in the future, but right now, <laughs> everything, well, everything will still be. I'm not going to change any of the stuff, I don't believe. I'm just going to start adding some stuff for the 5 and $10 tiers. But as of right now... All of the bonus content is available for $1 a month. Yeah, right? Um, there are a couple tiers that ha give you different perks, so check those out to see which one you'd like to be a part of. I realize I have been forgetting to do the Patreon shoutouts at the end of the show. Um, so sorry. I really, it, I didn't have Patreon for over a year, 
and I kind of really got out of the swing of it. So um, I'm trying to think of now that I'm kind of way behind on that. I don't know if I'm just going to space them out each week or if I should do some special episode where I just do them all at once. I don't know. Um, it's funny. That's like an ASMR thing. Um, like there's a lot of them have tiers or Patreon stuff or perks or whatever where they'll like, or you can submit and they'll read your name in like an ASMR e voice. Um, so if you would be interested in something like that, let me know. I don't know. Probably not, but I'm just throwing spaghetti at the wall to see what sticks. Um, okay. I'm really trying to think. I don't think I've, I don't think I forgot anything. If I did, then, you know, I'll see you next week. Um, thank you so much, by the way, to all of my new listeners. Um, I really appreciate the support. I have really seen those numbers jump up. So I know you're, you're here and thank you. I hope you enjoy it. Um, again, follow those socials. I have a great community, um, around the show, especially on Facebook. Uh, I know Facebook isn't everyone's cup of tea, but it's just a really convenient place to have like a group of people. Um, there's a Reddit too, but I don't check it. It's for you all to go be, be you. (laughs) So yeah. Um, okay. I think that's all. I'm going to go. I'm rambling extra. I'm extra rambly tonight. So it's very late. All right. I love you. Drink your water, please. Please drink water. Hydrate yourself. Take care of yourself. Do something nice for yourself this weekend. You know what? I am just do it. Okay. Buy yourself your favorite candy. Watch like your favorite YouTuber. Um, play your favorite video game. Uh, take a nap. I don't know. Take it, take some time, take a nap, take a hot bath. Um, do something nice for yourself. Take a like good hour or so or more or, you know, but at least like an hour this weekend and be like, this shall be told me to, this is my homework, um, from the lady who lives in my phone. Okay. Yep. I need to go. Okay. I love you. Um, go get some sleep. Sweet dreams.